Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we have another full slate of basketball games to talk about from yesterday. Um, it was not always, they weren't all very close games, but it was still exciting to watch, and I have a lot of takeaways to talk about, so I think that this will be another very fun video. So today, we're talking about uh, Nets Raptors, Jazz Nuggets, Sixers Celtics, and Mavs Clips. So, and then at the end, I will also preview game two today for my Milwaukee Bucks. We got the DiVincenzo jersey, we got the Bucks hoodie, and then we got the flat brim. So, I'm decking out in Bucks gear today for game two. Very excited. So. We'll get started with the Nets Raptors game. Unfortunately, I couldn't watch this game because I don't have NBA TV, which is a bit of a bummer. But from what I saw in the highlights and the box score, I just spent a lot of time pouring over those. And it looks like the Nets got off to a great start, which is not entirely surprising to me because, you know, they've got some they've got some guys who can get buckets. They've got some guys who can score. And if I was expecting them to go on some big runs to kind of Put the Raptors in a bit of trouble. Of course, the Raptors, every time they got a get bit of a gap, the Raptors were able to close it. But I think that if the Nets can get off to hot starts like that, they might be able to steal one in this series, which would be some great experience for some of the guys on their roster that will be staying around for the hopeful championship runs for them in the future. So guys like uh, Timothy Buawu Cabarro, I probably butchered his name, but um, he was knocking down shots. You've got um, Joe Harris, Karis LeVert. All of these guys can hit shots. So it's not entirely surprising to me that they could go on a huge offensive run and get a little bit of separation from the Raptors, although the Raptors are clearly a superior team. So it's not at all surprising that they were able to close the gap and win the game. Um Norman Powell, wow, he had a great game last, or I guess yesterday, wasn't exactly last night, but um, yeah, he looked really good, he was slashing, getting to the rim, and especially in transition, he looked great, he was getting in the open floor, and um, they couldn't stop him once he got ahead of steam, and he finished at the rim a couple of times, for sure, in transition, and then couple other times in the half court but he looks he looks really good I think he on this team every, obviously everyone thinks that the summer of 2021 could be huge for them they could sign Giannis or Oladipo or some an, or some star but if they are una unable to do that I think Norman Powell could really blossom for them into a pretty strong number two option maybe number three depending on what happens with Van Vliet down the line for them behind Pascal Siakam because Siakam is going to be a superstar like I think he will be top 10 within the next five years in the NBA but Norman Powell has a chance to be that second star for them maybe if he can keep playing like this because yesterday he looked great and this whole season he's been a really underrated player and I think that he's still pretty young, so there's still room for a lot of growth from him. And he looks like he can be a really, really good player in this league. Yesterday, obviously from the last time I talked about the Nets, you all know that I am a pretty huge Karis LeVert fan. I think that he's going to be really, really good, and I already think he is really, really good. And he was super deserving of making that second team all bubble. And... Yesterday, I saw something a little different from him. He was he was sharing the ball very well. He looked like a great passer. He had a few driving kicks out to three-point shooters. And mostly, it looked like he and um, the big guy, Jared Allen, had a really good two-man game going on. I'm not sure if it was always off pick and rolls or just drive and dump off to Jared for a dunk. But Karras really looked like he was... Had a lot of chemistry with Jared Allen, and that's something that comes with this experience of playing together for all these years. 
So that's something that the Nets are going to lose out on when KD and Kyrie come back. So I really hope they hang on to these guys, Karis and Jarrett, guys like that that are still young and can still be a part of their future because those two guys can blossom into really good players. So if they hang around and keep them around, they can help them win now because Jarrett Allen is a pretty prototypical rim-running center that can help a, help a team win when they have good wings and good guards, which obviously the Nets do. They have two top 15 players in KD and Kyrie when they're healthy. So he has a nice skill set to help them. And Karis LeVert might not be perfect because a lot of his skills overlap with the stuff that KD and Kyrie do. But I think he can be really good. Um, yesterday, his shooting efficiency was pretty horrible. I think he was something like 4 for 19. That might not be exactly what it was, but obviously that's not a great percentage. Right around 20-25%, not, not what you need out of a guy that's your best player if you're going to come away with an upset. So would he be perfect as an off-the-ball guy with Katie and Kyrie? I don't know. But I think that he has very high potential, and I think he's going to be a really, really good player in this league. Like I said, all-NBA potential, all-star potential down the line if he can become the number one player on a team. Um, Fred Van Vliet stayed pretty hot. He was hitting a bunch of shots. I know he didn't shoot as efficiently as he did in game one, where he went a ridiculous 8 for 10 for 3, but that kind of production was going to be difficult to repli replicate. However, he still scored in the 20s, and his passing looked really good. So... I, I, this is still probably the guy who has the most interesting free agency for me. Obviously, he's not the best free agent on the market because Anthony Davis, yeah, <laughs> you're not going to say Van Bleet's anywhere near that level, but considering Anthony Davis is pretty much considered a lock to stay in L.A., I think Fred Van Bleet might be the player with the most power to change up the NBA because the Raptors right now are a championship contender, and if they lose him... They get another year on Kyle Lowry. He grows a year older. Marcus Saul grows a year older. Assuming he even comes back, Serge grows a year older. Who knows where that team is next year? Are they still a top four team in the East? Probably. But I don't know if they'll be able to contend for a title if they lose him. And that is definitely one of the more interesting things. Of course, they could also go out and sign another good player to kind of fill in his role. But there aren't too many of those in this offseason. So, yeah, that free agency is interesting to me, and I'm excited to see what happens. Jared Allen, this is something I've noticed the past two years as he's started to play more and more for the Nets, but he's really a fearless rim protector. He will contest any shot. He has no fear of being dunked on, and he's good at his role. He's very similar to his teammate DeAndre Jordan from what I've seen. He might He's definitely a better shooter than DJ, but he's a rim runner. He can block shots, pretty good defender, and he's not afraid, like I said before. He's blocked Giannis before. He's blocked LeBron, I believe. So that's what you need from your center, a guy that can block shots, run, the, run to the rim, as you saw yesterday, had a couple dunks. And if that shooting can keep improving, he's got a lot of potential to be a good player. Well, maybe an above-average starter. The Raptors bench dominated yesterday. Obviously, with the kind of game Norman Powell had, you'd kind of expect them to because he was fantastic, as I've said already. But Ibaka played pretty well, too, and both of those guys had a huge impact on the game. They both had great plus minuses, and Ibaka didn't shoot the ball great, but those Nets backups are really overpowered. Those are guys that really should not be playing NBA games right now. They're not quite talented enough. Um, so it's it's not exactly impressive to be beating up on those type of guys, but Norman Powell was really good. Serge, as we saw last year in the playoffs, is a great player. So I'm 
I'm pretty high on this Raptors team, and if my Bucks keep playing the way they are, I think this team has to be the favorite to get out of the East with Gordon Hayward's injury. Although, Celtics look pretty good, but we'll get to that later. Jazz Nuggets, another game I didn't get to watch because I had cross-country practice during that time, but I would have loved to watch it. I really like the Jazz. I really love Donovan Mitchell. I think he's going to be first-team All-NBA level player by the end of his career. And um, it look, the Jazz played really well, and they kind of ran the Nuggets out of the gym, it seems like. They were easily the better team, and I think a big key for that is um, Joe Ingles and Jordan Clarkson were both really getting buckets. They were both scoring the ball well, and that's so key because obviously Donovan Mitchell is capable of scoring 57 points, as we saw now, but he's not going to be able to do it every game, and they can't rely on him to do it every game. So to get that kind of production from those two was huge, and that is a big reason why they won. And But Donovan Mitchell had a great game still, don't get me wrong. He shot so efficiently from the field. He was... 10 for 14 from the field, 6 for 7 from the three-point line, and 4 for 4 from the free-throw line. So a big reason why his scoring number went down was because he didn't get to the line as much as he did in Game 1. I think Game 1 he shot maybe 12 free-throws. So he didn't do that as much in this game, but he was still great because of his shooting efficiency. He created well for his teammates again with 8 assists, and he's... He's really good. He's an all-NBA level player next year, and I'm really excited to see if the Jazz can do anything to put better offensive players around him, although Bogdanovich and Conley will be back, so that'll be a boost for sure. Um, Mike Conley looks like he's going to be back for Game 3, I think I saw, so that could be pretty big. I know I said last time that I wasn't sure that he made too big of a difference, but after game two and seeing how, how well Donovan was able to play when he didn't have to shoulder so much of the scoring load and so much of the playmaking load with Angles and Clarkson taking that pressure off of him with those two hitting shots, I think just adding one more ball handler to the mix in Conley will be huge. And hopefully uh, Quinn Snyder decides to uh, remove Moutier from the rotation instead of Jawan Morgan because I think Jawan Morgan does a lot of things right and I'd like to see him out there for the rest of the series and Moutier I just don't think should be a guard who's leading your second unit and maybe I shouldn't say that he might be a guard capable of leading your second unit but with Jordan Clarkson out there he's a much better scorer Pro not as good a passer as Moutier because he doesn't pass, but those two kind of overlap a little bit in terms of being a ball handler guy, or maybe not a ball handler, but a guy who wants the ball in their hand, wants to be taking the shot, so I'd like to see Moutier out of the rotation and keep playing Jawan Morgan because he's done really well so far, I think. He only played 14 minutes, I think, yesterday, but he's a capable role player, and I like what he's bringing to the team. Royce O'Neal also made some really good passes, and that kind of got me thinking. Are the Jazz the best passing team in the NBA? Probably not. I didn't do too much thinking about what other teams would be competing with them, but off the top of my head, I mean, the Thunder have Chris Paul, so that gives them a boost. The Lakers have LeBron, so those two guys are probably the best passers in the NBA. But there were no teams that really came to my head. But watching Royce O'Neal make some of the plays he made, I think he threw a big alley-oop to Juwan Morgan. He created some plays for other guys, for shooters. And I was impressed with the way he played yesterday. So, hey, maybe the Jazz are the best passing team in the NBA. I don't know. I'd have to research it more to say for sure. But, yeah, that was a great game for them. Donovan Mitchell played great, Joe Ingles played great, Jordan Clarkson played great, and they were able to take game two. And I, I think that this this is a going to be a good series. I really hope that the Jazz can 
take it long, but I still think that the Nuggets, as great as Donovan Mitchell is, have the best player in the series in Jokic. But the Jazz have two and three in Donovan and Rudy Gobert. So this may be an upset they're capable of pulling. We'll have to wait and see. Game three yesterday was Sixers Celtics, and that game really started with Joel Embiid getting his takeover badge to reference 2K in the first quarter. He was getting in the low post, low, low post, and getting really easy shots, and that's what they need. He, they need him to take over the game because, in case you haven't noticed, Tobias Harris is not getting it done. This guy is getting paid so much money, so much money and he can't play like I mean obviously he doesn't he's not getting paid to be a second option because that should be Ben Simmons but Ben Simmons is out right now so they need Tobias Harris to step up and he has not done that they need more out of him I think yesterday he had 13 points on 4 for 15 shooting 4 for 15 he can't shoot like that if they're going to expect to win. And he needs to score more. They need him getting 20 to 25 a night. And he has not come close to that in these first two games. I think he scored 13 in both games. And in game one, my problem with him was that he was just not not looking to score the ball. But in this game, he was looking to score the ball just fine. He just couldn't get a shot. So they need more consistency from him. They need him to make better decisions on what shot he's going to take. It's just, I feel I feel for that Sixers front office because in Al Horford and Tobias Harris, they're giving big bucks to guys that are not worthy of it right now. So I don't know what's going to happen with those two contracts down the future because I'm not sure how tradable they are. But, well, ouch, not a good offseason for the Sixers this past offseason. However, uh, there is one thing from the Sixers that I took away as a positive from this game, and it has nothing to do with the actual Sixers. It's just that one of my predictions came true when I said Matisse Thibel would be starting over Al Horford, and I ended up being right about that, which I don't want to boost myself too much, but I'm pretty happy because I think it was the right decision for the Sixers. Um, Matisse did not play very well, actually. But I think he was minus 30, which is really, really bad. But I think it was the right choice because Al Orford was just too slow to guard any of those four perimeter guys for the Celtics. Obviously, with Marcus Smart stepping into Gordon Hayward's role. And maybe they could have kept Horford out there and just had him dare Marcus Smart to shoot because that guy loves chucking. He does not have great shot selection, Marcus Smart, that is. But I think that Thibault is the right choice to go with as a starter. Another thing that I want to talk about is Celtics' big man minutes when Daniel Tice is out of the game because I think Tice is great. He's got a great feel for the game. He plays well. Um, obviously, can't guard Embiid. As we saw yesterday, Embiid was handling him very well in the low post and getting whatever he wanted for a good part of the game. But then when Embiid stepped further away from the rim, it became a bit of a struggle because he wasn't getting as great of looks. But I want to talk about Inez Cantor and Robert Williams. I think Cantor's been playing more for sure, which is probably the right choice for Brad Stevens because Cantor's a really good rebounder. And he's a big body to throw at Embiid. I know he's not the best defender, but it seemed like a couple times he moved his feet well and kept Embiid in front of him. And I, he might be able to guard Joel for 15 minutes a night. Not super well. He'll give up a few more buckets than you would expect from Daniel Tice because he's a superior defender to Kanner. I don't think anyone's going to argue that. But offensively, Kanner brings shot making. And that's something that the Celtics need when they're with that bench unit because is Brad Mon is Brad Wanamaker going to get you buckets? Probably not. Grant Williams is not out there to score. He's more of a defender, although they did get some really good minutes from him yesterday. Knocked down a three. He was playing pretty good D. I think 
that going down the line, he can be a nice rotation piece for this Celtics team. Although he does remind me a bit of what we saw from Semi Ojale a few years ago. So who knows if he'll ever develop at all. But looks like a nice player. And he's only a rookie, so you'd assume that he'll progress, progress a bit down the line. And I'm all for it. Boston's 2-3 two, two, zone was really working well against Embiid. Um, the Sixers just struggled to get him the ball. And it 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 kind of suffocated the Sixers, and they struggled to score. Their offense just does not look good. With Tobias playing so poorly, Josh Richardson and Embiid look like the only two guys who are capable of scoring. I Shake Milton, too. Shake looked pretty good yesterday, but it's, it's a struggle for that team. I don't know where they're going to get buckets from, and if they play like they did yesterday... Bring out the brooms, because they're getting swept for sure if they continue playing that way. Um, Robert Williams, I want to talk about him too, since I talked about Canner. He's got what I'm starting to call Mitch Robinson-itis. He likes to contest, jump at every shot, and go for the block shot, and he ends up giving up a lot of offensive rebounds. Which is not not great. That's definitely something he can improve on. But I also think that similar to Grant Williams, he's still got some work to do, but he can be a rotation player for the Celtics down the line. Josh Richardson actually looked good yesterday. And so did Shake Milton, but I kind of want to focus on Josh Richardson because he played well in Game 1 also. And I think that... Is there anything... Is there any reason why this guy can't be a lead guard in the NBA? I don't really think so. I think that if he's on a team where he's the best guard, he's fully capable of playing that role. And I've always been a guy who's in favor. If Philly's going to trade Simmons or Embiid, they should hang on to Simmons. But because Simmons kind of overlaps a little bit with Josh Richardson's skill set, and Josh Richardson is clearly a more promising player than... Tobias Harris or Al Horford, and you'd rather have cater more to his skill set than Tobias or Al's. So I think after seeing that, maybe this is getting ahead of myself, but I'd rather see Simmons traded than Embiid if I'm the Sixers. I think that trading Simmons for, like, Buddy Heald and two firsts could maybe be something. I think Buddy Heald could bring some good spacing to that team because what they need is shooting. After they lost J.J. Redick, they don't have a lot of that. So if they can add a shooter, they keep Josh Richardson around to handle the lead guard roles. And they have Embiid, obviously, as a devastating post presence who can play really well on defense, too, and potentially win a defensive player of the year one day. That team sounds pretty good to me, so... I think that's something they should think about if they talk at all with Sacramento's GM, Joe Dumars. But who knows? This this is all hypothetical if they want to get rid of one of one of the two. So I'm probably getting ahead of myself. Um, last thing I want to talk about with this game is probably the most important part of why the Celtics played so well. It's that big three. Kemba Walker, Jason Tatum. Jalen Brown, those guys were hitting shots. Um, Philly's defense looked really lazy. They were just giving up good looks to these guys, not playing help defense. Um, and they, the Celtics just look like the better team, especially behind those three because all three of those guys are all-star level players. Obviously, Jalen wasn't an all-star this year, but he will be very soon, and... This team, this seems good, even without Gordon Hayward. I heard Stephen A. say yesterday that he thought Hayward's injury may be just something to give Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum a chance to get up more shots, which may be a blessing in disguise for the Celtics, but I'm not sure I believe that. I still think Gordon really impacts winning for this team, and they need him out on the court to reach their highest potential. 
And then the last game of the day yesterday was the Mavs Clips game. Um, I want to start off with Luca. This guy's outstanding. He's really, really so good. And I know I said it on Monday, but or Tuesday maybe it was, but I'm just so impressed. He's so young. What is he? Twenty, twenty-one, and he makes the right decision every time down the court, whether it's to take a pull-up, take a step back, get to the rim. Um, kick out to a shooter, or find a cutter. He always seems to be doing the right thing. He always seems to be making the right decision. And that's just so impressive sir, for someone as young as he is. Especially because, well, not especially because, but this is something that helps him for sure, is the tempo of his game. I, I liked what uh, the announcer said yesterday. I think it was Chris Weber said that... um. Luca just plays with such a good cadence to his game. Like, he's not the quickest, he's not the strongest, but he plays with a rhythm, and that rhythm really, really helps him to make these decisions and play so well. And yesterday, uh, the Mavs played great, and they were able to rest Luca. He only played 28 minutes. And that's so key because he's clearly the best player on their team and they need him in this series to be playing big, big minutes. And so for them to be able to play him as little as they did, and I know he was in foul trouble, so that may be a contributor, but that may be a blessing in disguise for the Mavs because if Luka's fresh for this series, I don't know, the Mavs might be able to be like the Blazers and pull a big upset. Imagine if the one and two seed lost in the West. That'd be nuts. But, yeah, this was a really fun game. Um, not having Pat Bev really made a difference for the Clippers, I think. Um, Luka played great, and so did Trey Burke. Trey Burke, holy cow. I think that there's some similarities between this guy and someone that he's playing against right now in Lou Williams. I think that Trey Burke definitely can reinvent his career now as a spark pl plug off the bench. And who knows, maybe he can win a six-man of the year. I'm not sure if the spot for him is in Dallas because um, he really needs the ball in his hands. And for him to play 25 minutes a night like Lou Will does and compete for sixth man of the year, he would be playing overlapping minutes with Luka. And when Luka's in the game... Who wants the ball in Trey Burke's hands? Sorry, Trey Burke, but I think I think you're great, Trey Burke, but you're not Luca. And so I think that in free agency this year, he'll have suitors. And I think there's a lot of teams where he would work because off the bench, he can just get you points. And that's valuable, as we've seen with Lou Williams on the Clippers these past few years. So Trey Burke belongs in the NBA, and I'm excited to see what his future holds. He's great in transition, and he plays really hard. In transition, he always makes the right decision. Well, not always, because he does get a little trigger happy and shoots almost every time, so I shouldn't say he makes the right decision. But his quickness and athleticism, I think he's got a little Russell Westbrook in him in transition because he can he can get to the rim, he can hit open jumpers. He, he looks like a really strong bench player, and I'm, like I said, excited to see what happens with him. Um, but not having Patrick Beverly was probably part of why he was able to go off like he did because, well, Patrick would probably be playing minutes where Luca's in so that he can be matched up on Luca. He also would be playing minutes where Trey Burke is in, and he's obviously the best matchup they have for a quick small guard. So, um, getting him back will be key. I'm not really sure what his timeline is, but the Clippers need him, especially on Luka. Another interesting thing to me was the Boban versus Montrez Harrell slash Michael Green matchup because those two guys cannot guard Boban. He's a real weapon on offense. He had 13 points and 9 rebounds yesterday in 10 minutes, so... I, I kind of think Rick Carlisle should play him a bit more because he's scoring points, he's getting rebounds. On defense, he did not look atrocious because 
Um, he was guarding Montrez, and he's got a pretty good height advantage on him, so it looked like he was a capable defender yesterday. And um, on offense, obviously, that's where his value lies the most. And he was really, really scoring. I think he, I don't know if he missed a shot. Every time they got the ball down to him in that low post, he was turning, making a move, finishing a dunk. So I'm happy with what I saw from him, and I hope Carlisle maybe bumps him up to more 16, 18, 20 minutes a game because in this series he can be a weapon because of how small those Clippers bigs are outside of Zubac. And Zubac is getting his run with the starters most of the time. So if you've got Boban coming off the bench, he's matched up with Manchez Harrell or Jermichael Green, and those guys are not tall enough to defend Boban, not even close. So I hope that they use him as the weapon he is um, later in the series. And he also rebounded really well. Nine rebounds in 10 minutes. That means his per 36 stat is like 34, 33 rebounds. Very impressive. Lou Williams kind of showed up his faults yesterday with some lazy defense, um, some whining on defense. If he thought he drew a charge, he would just stay on the ground. I noticed that one time in particular. And on offense, he gets a little trigger happy same as Trey Burke. I see a lot of similarities between those two, as I said before. But he also showed off his benefits because um, he's just a really good offensive player, and he can score points. He was the only Clipper with a positive plus-minus, I believe. I think he had a positive plus-minus. Don't quote me on that. But if not, he had the best plus-minus on the team. And I think that he's a a good player. I don't know how much longer he'll be able to stay at the level he is because he's getting up there in age, but Chicken Wing Lou, nice player still. And uh, Paul George's shooting with Spotty, I don't want to talk about that too much because he's a great player and he'll bounce back. The three guard lineup off the bench for the Mavs looked really good yesterday. Um, DeLon Wright, Seth Curry, and Trey Burke. They played well together, and um, DeLon Wright uh, had, a, had a really good pass. I don't remember who it was to. I just remember saying, wow, DeLon Wright, nice. Uh, Seth Curry had 15 points, I think, and we know he can score, as we saw with Portland in the playoffs last year. But he was plus minus, er, his plus minus was 30 in 26 minutes, which is outstanding. That's, that's amazing for Seth. And... He, he is a good player, he impacts winning, and the Mavs should be happy to have him on their roster because he's a, he's a good guy to have off the bench. I really like the Mavs bench. It looks like it's better than the Clippers bench because the Clippers have this vaunted bench, but the Mavs have been outplaying them. Um, DeLon Wright, Seth Curry, Trey Burke, Boban, these guys look good, and they are competing. They're playing hard. I like this Mavs team. I like this Mavs team. They're going to be able to push this series. And I also really like the Clippers. I still think that they're the championship favorite. But this is going to be a good series. And and they, if Paul George's shots are falling, that's a different game. But his shots weren't falling. So if they can slow down Paul George or Kawhi, if they can slow down one of the two, the Mavs are going to be in position to win. However, they were not able to slow down Kawhi. Yesterday, I thought Kawhi looked like 2019 version of himself with the Raptors leading them on that great championship run. He had 35 points and 10 rebounds on pretty good shooting, 10 for 21 from the field, uh, 2 for 6 from 3, and he got to the line 14 times. So, they need him, the Clips need him to take over games in this series because obviously no one can guard him. Maxi Kleba has drawn the Kawhi matchup, and that's not someone capable of matching up with a top three player in the NBA, especially one as skilled as Kawhi. So they need Kawhi to go takeover mode, and yeah, this is going to be a fun series. I think the Clippers will win in six games. That's my current prediction, but yeah, I'm excited to see what happens.